welcome to another episode of Stage to Sofa. I have got a very exciting international soprano with me today who I am over the moon to be speaking with. It is, of course, the fabulous Rachel Willis Sorensen, who made her professional debut in 2008 and since then her career has absolutely skyrocketed. She can be found on opera stages all over the world and concert halls all over the world, performing roles by Mozart to Wagner. It's incredible. So excited to have you here, Rachel. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Phoebe. Ah, oh, you're so, so welcome. My pleasure. How are you coping with this huge life change that you've been given? And how are you finding time off stage? Um, okay, well, that's a hard question. I, I think like everyone, when the lockdown began, I thought, okay, surely this will be two weeks, maybe three weeks. And then here it is dragging on. And I lost so much work. And that... I'm trying to be positive. I always try to be optimistic about, and I found a new way. I've been teaching voice lessons online to um, some of my social media following, and that's been really rewarding, trying to help people discover their own instruments. That's been really fun. And also then, you know, I've prevented myself from going bankrupt or whatever with the loss of all the income. But it's, uh, I am, I really yearn to perform again. It is like, a, I remember recently, someone mentioned I might be able to do Thais in concert and I was so excited and I listened to it this recording with Renee Fleming and Thomas Hampson and I just wept listening to the recording because I was like I used to do that <laughs> I used to sing with an orchestra all the time and it's funny because I mean it is always lovely I've never exactly taken it for granted but I just believed that it would I would have I didn't know that I would have to go so long between performing it is it is a real hardship. I'm not gonna lie. It's a hardship to give something that glorious up when the expectation was I'd get to do it. So I'm really hoping, keeping my fingers crossed and my toes crossed that soon the world will normalize and I'll be able to perform again with an orchestra. Also, I had some exciting, really exciting projects coming up in the fall and a few of them have been canceled already. It's just, so it's not, it's not an easy time, but also I'm trying to be positive. I've spent so much time with my children, which is lovely. Honestly, I've been really fortunate their whole lives because they've been with me on the road. Um, so this profession is a funny one. You get a lot of time off. You know, once a show opens, I only working two, three days a week. So the rest of the time I was completely with my children. So they're used to having me a lot, but I don't have to withdraw to go to three hour rehearsals and you know, mostly I'm just, I'm fully engaged with them 24 hours a day. So that's been really nice, a different kind of thing. And yeah, but uh, again, it's a, it's a loss. It's, it's sad to have to give up so many opportunities to perform. And I miss my colleagues and I miss hearing the music. I really, I mean, live music in the room is such a different experience to listening to it on recordings. As much as I love recordings and I'm listening to music, it's just not the same. So there's a bit of a void. Yeah, it's, it's not the same, you're right. And I know lots of other singers as well are so ready and raring to get back on that stage and start collaborating together. Um, <laughs> and so wonderful though, that you have had the positive of having much more time with your beautiful children. That makes a huge difference. And so, so blessed to have that time, which is amazing. And I'm thinking about your own childhood now. So I know you were brought up in Richland in Washington. What did your first experience of live music performance look like when you were a little girl? Oh, that's, no one has asked me that actually. I went to the symphony once in elementary school. I think I was in fourth grade and we went and heard the symphony playing. They played Beethoven and I went home and found, my parents had like this cassette tape with Beethoven and I listened to it over and over. It's funny because I wasn't, I, I, I'm not aware enough to know what specifically it was. I wonder if it was the Eroica, so the third symphony of Beethoven. I'm not sure. I think that's what it must have been because later in life, in college, when we were studying it, it was so familiar to me. It came in such, with such force. That must have been what it was. Funny, I'm sorry. I, I really haven't thought of that since then. That was my first experience with live music. My first experience with opera was much later when I was about 17. Um, there was a, the regional theater company did Carmen. And I went and saw Carmen. It's so great, great music, but like the story. Oh, the misogyny. I just, I struggle. At the time I was like, hmm. And the super titles went out in the middle of it. So you, it's in French and I couldn't understand what was happening exactly. But I loved the music and I loved the singing and the way those people were projecting without microphones. It was just, blew my mind. 
it is phenomenal, isn't it? That that human voice can reach that many people that far away. It's such yes. a marvel and one of the best parts about opera in my opinion. So I fully, fully agree with that. Um, now, you have had some incredible training. You've done, you know, your undergrad and your postgrad at university and you've gone on to the Houston Grand Opera program. I'm wondering how did you find that transition once you'd finished all of that education, which is very, very long, how did you manoeuvre your way into the international opera stage? How did that look for you? Oh, well, I did it largely with competitions, I would say. The first season out of the Houston Grand Opera Studio, I did the Belvedere competition in Vienna right away. Like, let's see, I finished in May and then I went on to do that in June and I won and I was given um, my first contract at Covent Garden which was to sing the Countess in the Marriage Figaro. And what else happened as a result of that? I just, I already had management, which I got after winning the Met competition in 2010. Um, so I guess the management, let's see, what else did I do? I ended up seeing an audition. So what happened was I won Belvedere. One of the judges of the Belvedere was Peter Katzner, who's the casting director at the Royal Opera House. And he invited me to sing for Tony Papano. So I met Tony in Copenhagen for the first time and uh, Pam, his lovely wife, played the piano and he sat in the audience of the radio concert hall in Copenhagen, which looks like a cave inside. It's really interesting <laughs> architecture. And I sang Dove Sono and he said, oh, I get it, you're the greatest singer in the world, but tell me a story. And I was like, what does it mean? <laughs> oh, and then he gave me also, so two contracts. I also was given the contract to sing Gutruna and go to Demeron there the following fall. So that was like a huge takeoff point. Once that happened, once I was like, I sang a title role, or not a title, excuse me, I sang a, a principal role at Covent Garden. That was like a new game, you know what I mean? But my, um, my management had me audition for a couple of best contracts. It's like a good way to bide your time, I guess. That's what they reasoned between being a young artist and proving yourself as a fully fledged artist. Part of the problem with young artist programs is that often singers aren't given enough performance opportunity and the best school you can possibly do is to do the thing itself. So to do a small role, to observe, real professionals doing bigger roles. Um, and I did a lot of covering when I was at Houston Grand Opera, but to sing on stage as a fest contract singer in Dresden, I mean, it was such a, a school of hard knocks, so to speak. Like I had to learn the basic day-to-day -day things, how it works to go to the costume fittings and the wig fittings and do everything really quickly and do multiple roles at the same time and prepare two, three roles in advance and all those skills that are really necessary for the success of the career. But also once you've had so much performance experience, I think you don't seem like such an untested quantity to other opera companies. So what's important I learned is advocacy. You have to have, before you have proven that you can do the thing, you have to have someone else vouch for you, be that person a manager, or another company. So when you're a young artist, the company is like saying, we, we believe this singer is gonna make it. So that gets your foot kind of in the door, in the proverbial door. <clears throat> and a lot of agents and companies, when they visit the company where you're a young artist, they will do an audition and hear the young artist. But I don't know if they take it that seriously, to be honest. The, what I've learned is that nobody really wants to take a risk on a singer and be wrong. They don't wanna be wrong. So you know, as soon as somebody else is saying they can really do this reliably over a period of time, then they say, okay, we will give them a chance. But you have to sort of, you have to get somebody to believe in you who will give you a chance before you're proven. And that's the hard part. That's the part you have to, you have to leap over some wide expanse, which I did that with competitions. And that's something I often recommend because just to be heard many times, is really positive. You, just, you have to spark the attention and interest of someone who has power to give you an opportunity. Absolutely. And I think it's a great platform to be able to place yourself to be in front of those people that may give you that opportunity. So yeah, I, I do understand that. And it's amazing that, you know, your career has just soared since then. And you've sang on so many amazing stages and you've debuted so many amazing roles. I'm wondering what your favorite <laughs> debut has been and why? What stage comes to mind when I say that? Oh man, that's a good question. Because I've loved so many places and for different reasons. Probably my most 
well, my favorite role debut to date was Rusalka, San Francisco a year ago. That was such a dream. I think it was the role, the conditions were amazing. The director, it was a, a David McVicker production, so amazing production. But it was mounted by Leah Hausmann. So a female director, a female conductor, a female diction coach, Jamie Barton and me. It was so like woman power. The experience was so positive, so much synergy, really positive energy in the room. And oh man, everybody was lovely. It was just a beautiful experience. And I loved also my debut at that company, San Francisco Opera, singing Ava and Meisterzinger a few years before. But let's see where I feel very at home at Covent Garden. I've sung there many times. And I, le I feel also at home at the Deutsche Oper in Berlin. It's hard to pick a favorite, favorite, favorite. Oh man, I guess if I could only pick one, I would say Covent Garden. Covent Garden is my favorite. I love the city of London. Oh, I have so many lovely friends there and I have so many positive associations. And I have the, the places I like to go and the, you know, I have the place I like to stay every time I go there and it just seems like a home away from home. So I really, I really love Covent Garden. I have a great, uh, like the, the audience is so warm to me and now I have rapport with them that I've developed over a few years and people tell me, oh, I saw you in this and this and this. So it's, yeah, that's probably my favorite company. Oh, Don't tell that's... other. Oh, so lovely. And I hope that soon you will be back on that stage singing. It was, it's been it's too long. Fun. We need you back. <laughs> now, you're so very busy as an artist. You're so in demand everywhere. And you're also juggling being a young mother and a voice tutor and an Instagram sensation. How do you manage your time and how do you balance your professional life with your personal life? Oh, that's such a good, good question. I don't think I'm as exemplary as it might look. <laughs> For one thing, I, I employ, like I said, a press agent, Olivia, and she is a dynamo and she has so many great ideas and she helps me with everything. She helps me with the schedule. She even schedules the voice lessons for crying out loud. And she takes care of the Instagram account. Occasionally we meet together and gather a lot of content and she releases it slowly. We talk together what direction we're going to go. And I tell her like, I would like to talk about this, but you know, generally she's taking care of the social media element, which is really nice. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, I, I've been traveling on the road with my children since they were born, and we have a really, really strong bond. That's my highest priority, I would say, and I spend the majority of my time with them. I am very stressed out most of the time. <laughs> I could use more sleep. I don't know exactly what the future holds. If this is a lifestyle I would recommend to another person, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, but I've done the best that I could with what was given me, and Things are transitioning. My daughter just finished the first grade, which we did online. And I'd like to keep doing that. I think for another couple of years, at least we can manage. Because I mean, do you remember the name of your best friend from the second grade? I don't remember. I don't recall. It just doesn't seem to me like, but I know eventually the children are going to have to be in school. And that's going to be a hardship for me as it is for so many of my colleagues who have children. I just have watched. Um, I've been really fortunate to be able to take them with me all the time because to not see your children for long periods is difficult, particularly for a mother. Um, I know you can do things, you can see them online, but to not get to hug and kiss them all the time, it's something that's been basically haunting me since they were born, like this notion that somewhere looming in the horizon is a time when, we, when I must leave them somewhere and go away. But I, I'm not ready to do that yet. I'm not ready, we'll see. And I think they're probably not ready for it either. Oh, anyway, I don't know. I'm sorry. It's funny. Life is an experiment. And I guess I thought I did believe I have believed that you could just do everything you wanted. You could just do it all. You just have it all. I don't know. Some, the thing is something has to give and, um, I'm working extremely, extremely hard. I am. And, uh, it's not easy and it's not been easy, but it's also been really glorious and there's been a lot of love and a lot of joy. So I don't know. What is the ideal life? I guess every person, that's not even what you asked me. How do I manage? How do I balance? Not very well. I just sort of cave in. Like, I, I feel that I go through these times and it's funny because I talk a lot of talk about things that I should, I should really take my own advice a lot, like drink enough water. Like I was thinking yesterday, oh my gosh, I think I only had <clears throat> not my full, uh, not the amount of water that I should be drinking, you know, for example. So you have to take care of yourself. You have to and it's very easy to put yourself on the back burner and put other people's needs before your own. I saw somewhere, uh, I think it was a TED talk, this one was saying, you must feed your children from your saucer rather than your cup. 
So if your cup is overflowing, then there's plenty from your saucer. But if you feed from your cup, it ultimately depletes you. And that's good advice. Probably I should learn to take. It's so hard, I think, for any young mum balancing, you know, under under tens in general, any children. It's it's a big responsibility, but you seem to be handling it incredibly well. So I mean, it's it's amazing, and I think having that, you know, yeah, having that awareness, like you said, that the self care is top. What have you found to be your biggest obstacle to get to the point that you're at? Because you're at such a high level and it comes with a lot of resilience and determination but what's been the biggest obstacle that you've faced ah uh, that is such a good question the biggest obstacle man i'm sorry the biggest one only one i have to pick only one i'm sorry superlatives are challenging am i right okay maybe the biggest obstacle is i don't i'm not exactly sure how to sum this up i got a lot of feedback about my personality being wrong for the profession from people um, in ways that hurt me. I was excessively sensitive and excessively dependent upon extrinsic validation. Um, and then I got a lot of criticism the, by virtue of being a young artist. That's what happened. They're trying to teach you to be an artist. And no one said to me the sentence, you must take responsibility for your own artistry. Instead of that, when I felt I was trying something out, often it was like wrist slaps, you know, like, no, you must do it differently. You must do what I want. You know, that's sort of the kind of coaching that I often received. And so I didn't really trust my own instincts. And then eventually I was told like, just this, this feedback became so much, I, I was trying to be, I think I became sort of temporarily a Frankenstein's monster of other people's ideas, musical ideas. And eventually I realized, I am not capable of fully executing those ideas because I'm not inside them. They, they came from someone else. I have a vague notion of what they are based on what I was told, but the only ideas that I fully internalize are my own, right? So the only version of this artistry that I'm even capable of putting into the world is my own. So the big challenge was coming to that realization. Ironically, the moment I said, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm going to say with this music what I want to say, no matter how it is received. Like in spite of whatever wrist slap is coming, I have no choice but to promote my own artistry. The minute I did that is the minute the criticism largely stopped. Because I think what people were criticizing was the eagerness to please sort of and the, there's like a, a hole in your armor when you're saying, do you like this? I mean, is this okay? You know, the monitoring and the looking for validation from the outside. Is this okay? Is this an okay choice to make here? You know, I was always looking in the room, like, do they like it? Are they, do they like it enough? Should I be doing more? Would you like more? You know, all of this pathetic sort of, I mean, you can't know what they want. And what I also realized is that they, the people on the outside, honestly, the majority of them have no idea what they want either. So they're not even in a position to tell you what you must do. It's up to you, the artist. And so I decided, okay, what do I like about this piece? I, it was the first time I realized that was Dichtor Rahalle. What do I like about this piece? What do I want to say with this piece? And I realized, ooh, I want the dynamics to be extreme. I want the softs to be so soft. And I want to do this big swell to the high B at the end. And it actually took me a few years to get it to the point where it was consistently what I wanted. And I, it's performed in like on YouTube in ways that I'm not, 100% proud of, you know what I mean? There were things I would have done differently, but I was pursuing this goal, this way of doing it artistically. And when I started doing that, the, the feedback just changed so much. It was night and day. Suddenly people who had said, I mean, once someone told me, or rather told, I am, I am told that someone told my boss, she's too fat to ever work in Europe. She's too fat to ever work in Europe. And I was about, I don't know, probably 30 pounds. No, maybe more. No, 30, 40 pounds heavier than now. Okay, whatever. I was, I'm not a thin woman, like whatever. But um, I was so devastated by this feedback because it means if you do fat to work in opera, it's like the beauty of your voice, your voice isn't good enough to compensate for your appearance, right? So I was like, I thought, I mean, I'm not delusional. I don't think I'm like the most beautiful woman alive, but I thought that I, when my singing was good enough, that I was worthy of a platform and to be told like, 
you're never going to work in Europe because of what you look like, which is so funny because then for years I carried this around, this chip on my shoulder. And every time I had success in Europe, I thought it was in spite of me rather than because of anything I was doing. And so funny, that same person who said that heard me again, the, the time when I realized I must take responsibility for my own artistry was in like 2014 when I came to this like brilliant realization, oh my gosh, you must do as your heart desires. That's your only real choice. Anyway, after hearing me sing that way, he said, I heard you a few years ago in Houston. I don't know if you remember me. And I was like, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't know what he said. That was like, I've carried you around with me in my sad little pocket ever since. Then. <laughs> but anyway, um, he said, I didn't understand what you were. That was what he said. I'm sorry. I didn't understand what you were. So it's really funny because that person that I held him had this bully that was sort of abusing me for years and years without even knowing he did that just because he made some stupid off the cuff comment that leveled me to be honest like I really let it go way too far um but he took he recanted when when I was able to show the message that I always had so this is my biggest thing with my my Instagram following or my my social media presence I'm trying to convince singers and people generally that they have to listen to their own gut and do what their own gut is saying. And it's hard in a field where you're constantly told you don't know what you're doing and you need a lot of training. You need to have the instinct beaten out of you. That's absolutely untrue. The instinct, the thing that brought you to it in the first place has to be honed and developed and encouraged and nurtured rather than beaten. So that was the biggest hardship, overcoming that, overcoming the voice that says, your inadequacy will prevent you from being able to have the platform you need to share the message that you and you alone were born with. So, but that's true of everyone. Everyone, I'm listening, oh my gosh, I'm listening to an audiobook right now as, and I'm loving it so much. It's Orson Scott Card's Song Master. Woo, a director recommended it to me. And anyway, this boy, this little boy, he's like a songbird. And anyway, he sings people their songs. He wants to hear people's songs. And this is, it's like, it's the most beautiful analogy that each person is born with songs and they, their, their life experience, they collect their songs and within them is a song, a message. And he, his purpose is to try to hear that song and sing it back to them. And it always moves people to tears and they feel so understood and it's this beautiful notion. But it's true, you have your song. So when you are, you're, you have to sing your song through, as a classical singer, through the pieces that you're given. And I'm sorry, this is really like, woo woo, and what does it mean? I don't know if it's psychological, if it's spiritual, but you have to learn to sing your own song rather than trying to sing other people's songs. That's the hardship. Yeah, I, no, I fully, and thank you for that recommendation. That's fabulous. I will definitely be reading that. Um, now, I'm wondering, what does that moment feel like now for you, now that you've got to that stage where you're completely, fully comfortable and you know who you are as an artist, what does that moment feel like when you're exchanging so much of yourself to the audience in front of you? Oh, that's magic. It's the most magic, you know, to, because that's the thing. My whole life long, I felt burgeoning with message. I'm burgeoning, like I'm exploding with this I have to share it. I have to like, I remember saying to the administrators at the Houston Grand Opera Studio, we had a meeting when it was, I don't know, when I was there as a young artist and I just said, thank you so much because I have to share my message. And they were like, cool. I don't think, I, <laughs> maybe it's not normal. I really believe it is. I believe everybody has this. You have something in yourself that is bursting forth. It's dying to get out of you and get in front of other people to be, you know, metabolized by the world around you to see what like what beauty can you contribute to the human race the most recent performance experience that i had was oh the jonas kaufmann Wien tour and les Ignaux in geneve so both of those things were happening concurrently and i had a lot this was in the beginning of this year before covid happened and the world went to the twilight zone um i told i had such a rich beginning of 2020 of performances. Maybe that's so lucky because I could save up that energy, whatever that is, but it is magic. It is pure magic to be on stage with the orchestra. You're just this synergy, you're working together and you're working together with the audience. I feel like I can almost see it. I can almost see, you know, the hearts of people opening up and receiving and some of them aren't, you know, some people aren't receptive, but you can see people being moved by what's happening. You know, and it's not a matter of like they're weeping. I just think 
there's some sort of metaphysical connection happening between the audience and the stage. And they are such an important part because we can create some magic for ourselves, but when an audience is and we're doing it for this other purpose, for the enlightenment of an external force, it's just, it, it's indescribable. It's indescribable, it's magic. My favorite rehearsal day is usually the Zitzprobe because you're first with the orchestra and I think it's the group, everybody singing together. The first time I did one was Lohengrin. Lohengrin is a huge piece and the orchestra was in front of me. I was on the lip of the stage. They had the chorus behind me, the orchestra in front of me. I was just covering, but the, the real Elsa was ill and so I got to do the Zitzprobe. And I couldn't believe, like the men's chorus standing directly behind me, this wall of sound and this wall of sound from the orchestra. And I was like swimming in the middle of it. And I thought, oh my gosh, to be a part of this. But then to be a part of it and share it with the audience, it is absolute magic. It really is special. And again, I don't know if it's um, just in my head. I, I know other people have described a similar phenomenon, but it just feels like I'm getting an opportunity through the the lens of this pre-composed music to express my own self, my own gift with the audience. And I feel like I'm contributing to the overall beauty in the world. And it's like, it just feels very ennobling and, and humbling to be a part of something so, so big. But also then sometimes it's depressing because you're like, is this working? Does anyone care about what we're doing? You know? So I have to remember that they do. I have so many experiences, people coming to me and saying, that it really meant something to them. But also the act, the expression itself is so good. It's, it feels so good that it's actually its own reward, even, in the, even independent of an audience. But that is the ideal scenario, that everyone's hearts are melded and we're, ha we're sharing this musical experience together and nobody walks away from that identical to how they were when they went in. 100%, and I, I'm wondering now what that moment before you go on stage. So when you were in the wings and you've got a big debut at a new opera house and I know you've sung at nearly all of them now, so <laughs> that won't be happening no. much sooner, but when you've had those debuts, what does that moment look like for you when you're about to walk on? How do you cope with the pressure that you're about to have to focus into? That's a good, another good question. Um, I pray a lot. I'm like, please help me to do okay. Like there's a lot of meditating and deep breathing and, Usually, I mean, I was saying earlier, you need advocacy, you need an opera house or a manager as a young artist to say, this is the singer can do it. Um, but also you can do that for yourself. Like at a certain point I realized like, I know this, I know how to do this. You know, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna do my thing. I'm gonna open up my heart, I'm gonna share it and no one is gonna die from this. That's the other thing. It feels very scary. Like there would be some disastrous consequence if it went badly. I have been in situations where it went really badly and everyone was fine, everyone lived. So there's not like a real risk of life and limb, even though it seems so severe and everything will change. I mean, once, <laughs> once I was doing Cosi Fantute and the wig, so I'm Fiorilegi, right? The wig of one of the men, the Albanians, you know, when they d disguise themselves, got caught on a button on my costume because he was feigning illness and I was supposed to be nursing him back to health. I was like, you have to help them. And his wig got caught on my button and he was, we were supposed to go on with the staging and we couldn't, and I was just, I couldn't, I didn't know I was trying to rip it, rip the button, rip the wig. Like we just panicked. The whole audience knew it. It was like, we couldn't conceal it. And we both completely broke character. Everyone on the stage is laughing. The audience is laughing. And it was terrible. It was like the worst case scenario, you know, this, this mad event, we've just rehearsed for weeks and weeks and here we are ready to do it. And it's going so badly. And it was like a highlight for everyone who saw it. It's funny how you can't plan these things, but people loved it. People still talk to me about that stupid event where the button was stuck on the wig. And then eventually I think the wig came off. Like it was just, it was a comedy of errors, you know? And when people encounter that sort of thing. So I tell myself that like no one dies from this going badly. Um, the worst case scenario is actually not even that. The worst case scenario is that you get selfish and you don't share from your heart. And then that's a waste. That's really what's bad. And actually, unfortunately, that happens a lot. So, and again, nobody dies from that. So really the risks are kind of low, even though it feels so scary and it feels like this will be public humiliation. You know, if I don't know. So you have to take responsibility and you have to believe I guess you could trip and fall. I don't know, even then, 
it all is okay. It all turns out to be okay. And I think you just have to have faith in that. Like the, the experience itself is worth the risk. So then right before I go on, if I'm very, very nervous, I just deeply breathe and I remind myself that I know what I'm doing. I've prepared well and I'm excited about it. Usually I focus on some element of it that I've loved the process itself or the pe usually it's the piece. Also, by the way, usually what's happening right before I go on is an overture. And if I'm preset, I'm listening to the overture and that is so soothing. It's so soothing to remember that I'm a part of this holistic thing, this giant experience and I'm gonna contribute my, to my best, the best of my ability to be a part of it, to be worthy of it. But you know, to, to hear the other parts is really helpful because we're working together to promote the same holistic thing. Definitely. And we are just vessels, aren't we, that just are able to, you know, give our soul through these amazing bodies that we've been given. So, yeah, that's very good advice to just breathe and listen to your other colleagues and feel their energy as well. Rachel, we've come to our final question now. It's been so amazing to speak with you. But I have come to my final question, which is what piece of advice would you give to an 18 year old Rachel? Oh! An 18 year old me. To an 18 year old me, I would say breathe and trust and believe in yourself more than you do. When I was 18, I really thought that I, I, I didn't really think I had anything to contribute and I didn't really understand. I felt this need to do so. I wanted to sing so badly, but I thought it was an unreasonable career to pursue and I was doing it, but I didn't have a lot of faith. I would say, believe in yourself and just trust your gut trust life you know trust god keep going keep going and don't stress don't worry about the future so much just really enjoy these moments i think i was too anxious about not knowing how everything would turn out so i didn't really lean into the pleasure and the joy of being young and having those new experiences i wish that if i had it to do over again that i would do that i would lean into the joy that's so amazing. Thank you so, so much for being such an incredible guest on this series. I really appreciate it. And I'm over the moon to have you. My pleasure.